Exodus chapter 33. Well, relationships are very special. If you've ever done something to jeopardise one, you'll know the terrible feelings of loss and shame when you wake up the next day and realise that things may never be the same again. And that's how it is for God's people here in chapter 33. See, out of all the people in the world, God had chosen them to be his very own. He'd rescued them from slavery in Egypt. He'd fed them manna from heaven in the wilderness. He led them by his own presence. But when Moses, God's appointed leader, spent time out of the people's sights, on top of Mount Sinai, speaking with God, they very quickly turned to Aaron and asked him to make them a God that they could see. And rather than wait to find out what God had to say, they decided on their own way of worshipping God with disastrous results. But for the intercession of Moses, sent back down the mountain to sort them out, they would have all been struck down by God. And it's the covenant that stops God from acting in that way. He had made promises to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, and he was going to keep them. But all in the garden is not rosy. Our chapter begins with God reiterating his promises to Moses. Verse one, leave this place, you and the people you brought up out of Egypt, and go up to the land I promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants. I will send an angel before you and drive out the Canaanites, Amorites, Hittites, Perizzites, Hivites and Jebusites. Go up to the land flowing with milk and honey. Well, great, fantastic. So everything's healed then. Moses interceded and the people are forgiven. Well, not quite. There is a sting in the tail. Verse three. But I will not go with you, says God, because you are a stiff necked people and I might destroy you on the way. So God will keep his promise. He'll give them the land, but he won't go with them. God's gift, but God, not God's presence. Now, in today's world, that might seem like a pretty good deal. Get all the good things and you don't have to worry about a God who might demand something of you. But a world without God is not all it's cracked up to be. And the people of Moses' day know it and they mourn. Verse four. When the people heard these distressing words, they began to mourn and no one put on any ornaments. And if you've ever imagined what life would be, what it would be like without God in it. Not that you've decided suddenly to reject God, but that he has completely withdrawn, disappeared. There's no one in charge, no one to listen to your prayers, no one behind the scenes guiding, and absolutely no eternal future. Well, the disciples grasped what this would mean in John chapter six. If you remember the incident, Jesus had been telling the people that he was the new bread from heaven, that he was the new Passover lamb, and that the way to eternal life was to eat and drink of him. And it caused a terrible stir. And many of his disciples, in fact, nearly all of them, when you read the passage, had left him. Things were so bad, that Jesus turned to his closest friends, the twelve, and asked them, you don't want to leave too, do you? Well, Simon Peter could see things exactly as they were and replied, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And that's the crux, isn't it? Without Jesus, there is no life. If God withdraws his presence, what you see is literally 
all there is, nothing else. And it is a very serious situation to be in. Now, if you're watching this online and assuming that you can have all of God's good things and reject him, then be very clear about what you are choosing. The people of Exodus 33 knew and they mourned. But it's not the end for those people of Exodus 33. They still have Moses. And Moses has a special relationship with God. And verses 7 to 11 detail Moses' regular practice. Moses used to take a tent and pitch it outside the camp, some distance away, <laughs> calling it the tent of meeting. Anyone inquiring of the Lord would go to the tent of meeting outside the camp. The Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. Now, this isn't the tabernacle. Moses has only just got the instructions for the tabernacle and a chance to make it. He hasn't even told the other people about it yet. This is a simpler tent, but for that same purpose, meeting with God. And notice how close that relationship is between Moses and God. They speak like friends. And it's a closeness that comes from spending time together. Wonder how close your relationship with God is. Do you spend dedicated time with him outside of church every day, coming before God, reading his word, praying? And you see, because Moses has this relationship with God, it makes it so much easier for him to talk to God when a real crisis hits them. And the same is true for us. Now, we're not in the same position as Moses. He was like the sole person there to intercede for the people with God. But the lesson still applies. If we take time with God in the good times and in the ordinary times, it's so much more natural for us to go to him in the tough times. And because of this close relationship, Moses can ask some pertinent questions. And in verses 12 to 23, he asks for three things. The first one is a simple, practical one. Verse 12, you've been telling me, lead these people, but you have not let me know who you will send with me. Well, Aaron, of course, has been the, the go-to guy. He went with Moses to speak to Pharaoh, if you remember all those chapters ago. But Aaron's been caught up in this kind of golden calf thing. So can it still be Aaron? Who will go with Moses? Well, God says, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. So God himself will go in a very real way. Moses won't be on his own striving for the people. God himself will be with him and take the burden. And that word rest, I will give you rest, is a key word. It makes us think of the rest promised when they reach the promised land. But there's also a daily rest, a rest that comes from trusting God with the big things of life. And that's what God promises, not just to Moses, but to every believer. Jesus said, Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Two rests, the future rest in heaven, but also rest now, placing ourselves in God's hands, letting him take the burden. Well, the second question is perhaps a little bit more surprising. Verse 13, if you are pleased with me, teach me your ways so I may know you and continue to find favour with you. Now, Moses has just spent 40 days and 40 nights on the mountain with God. And before that, he met him in his special tent. You would think that he would know God by now, wouldn't you? But that is the amazing thing about God. 
The more you take time to know him, the more you want to know him. The more you read the Bible, the more you realise there's so much more to know. And even Paul felt this way. Do you remember the words of Philippians chapter 3 verse 10? Paul says, I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. And so somehow attain into the resurrection from the dead. I want to know Christ, he says. And this was written right near the end of his life. If Paul didn't know Jesus, then who did? But it's that desire to know him more and more. And you can have that too. Ask God. Start each day reading your Bible, praying. Watch your appetite for God grow. The third question Moses asks is simply astonishing. Now show me your glory, he says. Show me exactly who you are, God. Don't hold anything back. Well, what a question. This is the God who has just given Moses detailed instructions for a tabernacle with curtains to block off the way to him, with altars for sacrifices just so people can draw near. And Moses is asking to actually see him. That is dangerous stuff. So why would Moses ask it? Well, Moses has just secured God's promise that he won't abandon the people in the promised land after all, but that his presence will go with them. So this request is for a little bit of assurance. The people had behaved so badly had God really forgiven them? And God agrees to Moses' question, but with safety protocols added. Verse 20, you cannot see my face and live. Well, what a reminder to us of the holiness, the power, the splendour, the might of God. Even Moses, who spoke to him like a friend, couldn't see his glory face to face. We must never make God too small because God hasn't changed. One glimpse of God without the protection of Jesus and we die instantly. That's who he is. But notice the tenderness of verse 21. There's a place near me where you may stand on a rock. When my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft in the rock and cover you with my hand until I've passed by. Then I'll remove my hand and you will see my back, but my face must not be seen. So God will pick him up, put him in a place of safety, cover him with his hand, shield him so that he's not harmed. Isn't that beautiful, that image of God shielding him with his hand? When he's safe, he'll take his hand away. It's a bit like a parent shielding a child's eyes, taking the hand away when it's safe. But you know, God has done even more for us. Because of Jesus, we will be able to see God face to face. He exchanged our sin for his righteousness. So we'll be able to look upon God in his glory but only if we are Jesus's. But isn't that amazing? We'll be able to do what at that point Moses couldn't do. I'm sure we've seen him face to face now, but never take that for granted. So a disturbing in some ways, look at life without the presence of God, but a reminder too that God will keep his promises. He's provided one even greater than Moses to intercede for us. And through the cross, we'll be saved from the burning glare of God's glory. We'll be able to see him face to face. So keep on getting to know him. Ask him to draw you closer and deeper so that your faith might be strong in times of trouble. And praise him for his compassion and his mercy. Well, a word of prayer. Our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your glory. 
We thank you that you are holy and mighty and powerful and good. We thank you for your mercy and your compassion. And we thank you for this great privilege that we'll have through Jesus of one day seeing you face to face. Oh, we thank you so much. And we pray that you would help us to know you more and more. That you'd fill us with this desire not to settle with what we've already got, but to know you more deeply so that we can follow you more faithfully day by day. So come Holy Spirit, help us. Help us to know you. Help mm -hmm. us to follow you. Help us to serve you and love you as you deserve. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.